appreciate the, the turnout here and especially the turnout by the press. Thank you for that. As many of you know, I, I have not participated in any public events before today. I also avoid any interviews with the media. And it was and still is my belief that Bradley Manning deserves an attorney that is focused on what is happening in the courtroom and only what is happening in the courtroom. And that is why I have chosen not to do the uh, interviews at this point. But today, however, marks a milestone. And it was actually supposed to be an ending point, really, to the motions hearings uh, that we were going through. And it would mark the end of the motions phase, working our way into the trial phase. And the motion that we were doing, and, and unfortunately still are, is the unlawful pretrial punishment motion. And it's taken longer than expected, but I must tell you, I'm not really that disappointed by that. I'm enjoying my opportunity to cross-examine those who had Bradley Manning in those conditions for nine months. Yeah. As I take an opportunity, though, to reflect on the last two years, I think it's, it's fitting that we're here today at the end of the motion phase with a motion that really brought the world's attention to this case. And that was how Bradley Manning was being treated. Brad's treatment at Quantico will forever be etched, I believe, in our nation's history as a disgraceful moment in time. Not only was it stupid and counterproductive, it was criminal. An entire group of individuals who I no doubt are honorable men and women chose to turn a blind eye to how Bradley was being treated. Those who could affect change did not. They were more concerned about how the attention might be put on them if something happened to Brad, as opposed to what was their conduct doing to Brad. But it turns out those same people cared about something more. And what they turned out to care about more was the media impact. And for that, I must thank each and every one of you here today. I must thank each and every one who is listening or watching. Because without you, change would not have happened. Your actions resulted in Brad being moved from Quantico to Fort Leavenworth. Make no mistake about that. And with your actions, the draconian conditions that you lived under for nine months came to an end. The magical waters of Fort Leavenworth apparently healed him, and he was no longer required to live in the conditions that he was in. Now we all know Brad cannot be here tonight, but he knows tonight has happened. And he wanted me to personally thank each and every one of you. Thank you for taking the time to write to him, for signing petitions, for attending marches, rallies, and other public events. Thank you for writing to the military and to our government, complaining about his conditions. Thank you for donating to his legal defense, for volunteering at Courage to Resist and the Bradley Manning Support Network. But most of all, he wanted me to thank you for caring, caring about him. The battle that we have waged for the last two years could not have been fought without your help. And it has been a hard fight so far. We are currently at over 450 appellate exhibits in this case, and that amounts to just over 20,000 pages of written motions and attachments. I am confident by the time this case comes to a conclusion, the record of trial will be the longest record of trial in our military's history. And that record will reflect one thing, that we fought at every turn, 
at every opportunity, and we fought to ensure that Brad received a fair trial. Now my office website can keep track of a few things, and I want to share some numbers with you that I am personally, uh, I guess, happy to see. And that is over 764,000 people to date have gone and read at least something about Brad on my webpage. We've received over 72,000 pieces of mail from Brad since his beginning in confinement. Over 14,000 individuals have donated to the Courage to Resist or the Bradley Manning Defense Fund. And 754 supporters have donated directly to his legal defense fund managed by my office. And today, I want to take the opportunity to thank you. Thank you for getting involved. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy life, not only to be here today and to listen to what I'm saying, but thank you for caring about Brad. Thank you. When I'm in the courtroom, I stand up and I look to my right, and I see the United States government, the United States government with all of its resources, all of its personnel, I see them standing against me and Brad. And I have to admit to you, that can be rather intimidating. And I was intimidated. Especially when the President of the United States says, your client broke the law. Especially when Congress members say, your client deserves the death penalty. I want to tell you though today, as I stand here, I'm no longer intimidated. I am not intimidated because when I stand up, I know I'm not standing alone. I know I'm not alone because I turn around and I see the support behind me. I see members here today in the audience that are there every time we have a court hearing. I see my, what I now am going to affectionately call the truth battalion. <laughs> Those who wear nothing but a, well, they wear the thing, but they wear a black shirt that <laughs> has the word truth on it. And they're behind me. And when I look there, I know that I also have unlimited personnel and unlimited resources. But perhaps the best evidence for me that I am not standing alone when I stand for Brad is a website called IamBradleyManning.org. I personally have to tell you, I go to this site at least once a day. I go to the site when I need to recharge my batteries after working a long day on the case. And I just peruse the photographs. People with a simple statement in front of their face. I am Bradley Manning. It's amazing the power of those simple words. What that, those words mean to each individual, I do not know. But I want to take a moment to share with you what that may mean to Brad. During our countless conversations, I had an opportunity to talk to him about his future. And I said, Brad, what do you want to do when this eventually comes to an end? And he told me that his dream would be to go to college to get a degree. And as a young man, at that time he was 23, that makes sense. We all know that college degrees are pretty much the ticket to a productive future. So I asked Brad, well, with that degree, what do you plan on doing? And he said, I want to go into public service. And I asked him, what do you mean by that? He said, I, I want to join some sort of campaign group, go into public service, and perhaps one day run for public office. 
And I asked Brad, why would he want to do that? And he said, I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference in this world. I can tell you that standing here today, I hope that someday soon Brad can go to college. I hope someday soon he can, in fact, go into public service. But I am confident as I stand here today that Brad doesn't have to worry about making a difference in this world. He has made a difference. <laughs> Last Tuesday, the President of the United States signed into law the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act. As President Obama was signing this bill into law, Brad and I were in the courtroom for the start of his unlawful pretrial punishment motion. How can you reconcile that? I don't know the answer to that question. One of uh, our nation's most famous whistleblowers, Daniel Ellsbury, has on multiple occasions spoken out for Brad. History has been the ultimate judge of his courage and sacrifice. History has judged him well. I hope that history will judge private first class Brad the man in a similar light. I thank you for coming here today. I thank you for listening.
And to make sure those that you've elected into public office understand your views. Generally, perceive the other. 
Well, I think I might have answered that question. I, I can tell you that if, if you do, in fact, uh, look at the rights, if, if, and this is more when I taught military law to non-military attorneys, we would compare the various rights that you have in a state or a federal court against the rights that you have in a military court. And in every instance, the military court rights exceed that that you would have as a normal citizen in state or federal court. So I, I think this is a, an issue in which um, a lot of times the suspicion, once you're informed, doesn't bear out. You start to, to believe that you know this is a very fair system. The suspicion, I think, though, of the military justice system is because, in some regards, it's, it's foreign, obviously. But never forget that the military is made up of basically our sons and daughters, husbands, wives, fathers, and mothers, just like yourself. And it is a, in my mind, it's not a perfect system, but it is one of the, the, the best systems that I've had the opportunity to practice in front of. Um, this is maybe the same kind of question to see what, what you think. What do you take with you most from the military service and your time in civilian life? I think military service, maybe, I can tell you a little background story about it. I was on active duty uh, as a major. I just went through a, a course that would have ultimately put me on the track of a lieutenant colonel. 